Hello everyone and welcome to Philosophication, Lonely Beard Edition. Um, so I'm trying something a little bit different today. Um, I've been thinking about the Christchurch shooting in New Zealand that happened recently and I've been thinking about something kind of related to that that I had on my mind. Um, I'm trying something a little bit different today. I'm just talking off the cuff without writing a script first. Uh, not sure how it's going to go, but we'll find out. Um, so, this mass shooting happened in New Zealand, and the reaction, from what I can see, has been pretty predictable. Uh, everyone has been basically reacting how you would expect them to. But there's one particular aspect of the reaction that has stuck out to me and, and reminded me of something I read a while back. Um, specifically something I read in this book, The Gulag Archipelago, by Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Um, so, it, it, and it reminded me of a particular chapter in this book. Um, so I wanted to talk about it. So, it, the aspect of the reaction to this is something that happens basically every time there's an event like this, like a mass shooting or some some act of terrorism, some evil act. Um, and among all the all the other things that happen with people reacting to this, one thing that people tend to do is to dehumanize the the terrorist or the shooter or whoever it was. Um, and based on what I read a while back in the Gulag Archipelago, I think that's a mistake to, to do. Um, you, you'll hear people saying things like, this guy was a monster, he was... Uh, people will use dehumanizing language to talk about the shooter. And I think what they're trying to do is to distance humanity from this evil act. We're trying to distance ourselves uh, we're trying to say that the terrorist was not what we are. The terrorist was something other than human. He, he was a uh, psycho or he was ideologically possessed to the point where he did something that is that, that average humans are just completely incapable of doing. People are people generally speaking aren't capable of acts on that level of evil. And we use this language, monster or psychopath, things like that. And those things are true. I'm not saying they're not true. But when we talk about these terrorists in those terms, I think what people are trying to do is distance the rest of humanity from that. And, and this, will make, this will make more sense when I get to this, um, reading this chapter. But... Um, I don't say any of this out of concern for the shooter. Uh, obviously, what he did was evil, and I want—I would like to distance myself from that too. Um, but I say this because I think when we when we talk this way, when we use this kind of language, we we run the risk of ignoring our own capacity for evil. We are trying to pretend that it's not there. So I, I'll bring this back around. This will make more sense what I, once I get into this chapter. But I thought what I would do is to, to illustrate this is just start reading. Um, this is the Gulag Archipelago, part one, uh, chapter four. It's called The Blue Caps. Um, so I thought it's not a terribly long chapter, so I thought I would just start reading it um, and react to it as we go. So, so I have read this book um, a while back. It's been a while, but I haven't read it recently, um, other than skimming this chapter really quick before I started recording here. But um, so I'm going to be reading this uh, with sort of fresh eyes, kind of commenting on it as I read for the first time in a while. So, here we go. Chapter 4, The Blue Caps. 
Throughout the grinding of our souls in the gears of the great nighttime institution, when our souls are pulverized and our flesh hangs down in tatters like a beggar's rags, we suffer too much and are too immersed in our own pain to rivet with penetrating and far-seeing gaze those pale night executioners who torture us. A surfeit of inner grief floods our eyes. Otherwise, what historians of our torturers we would be? For it is certain that they will never describe themselves as they actually are. But alas, every former prisoner remembers his own interrogation in detail, how they squeezed him, and what foulness they squeezed out of him. But often he does not even remember their names, let alone think about them as human beings. So it is with me. I can recall much more, and much more that's interesting, about any one of my cellmates than I can about Captain of, Se of State Security Yezapov, with whom I spent no little time face to face, the two of us alone in his office. So right, right away in the first uh, in the first paragraph, he's he's talking about how gulag prisoners generally don't think about their torturers as human beings. They, they it doesn't even that's not a way that they think about them. They're they're just monsters, um, which is understandable for people to feel that way. Um, but that that'll be a, an important point to come back to later. There is one thing, however, which remains with us all as an accurate, generalized recollection. Foul rot, a space totally infected with putrefaction. And even when, decades later, we are long past fits of anger or outrage in our own quieted hearts, we retain this firm impression of low, malicious, impious, and possibly muddled people. There's an interesting story about Alexander II, the czar surrounded by revolutionaries, who were to make seven attempts on his life. He once visited the house of preliminary detention on Spalernaya, the uncle of the big house. Russian pronunciations, not terribly good at them. He once visited the house of preliminary detention on Spalernaya, the uncle of the big house, where he ordered them to lock him up in solitary confinement cell number 227. He stayed in it for more than an hour, attempting thereby to sense the state of mind of those he had imprisoned there. One cannot but admit that for a monarch this was evidence of moral aspiration, to feel the need and make the effort to take a spiritual view of the matter. But it is impossible to picture any of our interrogators, right up to Abakumov and Beria, wanting to slip into a prisoner's skin even for one hour, or feeling compelled to sit and meditate in solitary confinement. Their branch of service does not require them to be educated people of broad culture and broad views, and they are not. Their branch of service does not require them to think logically, and they do not. Their branch of service requires only that they carry out orders exactly and be impervious to suffering, and that is what they do and what they are. We who have passed through their hands feel suffocated when we think of that legion, which is stripped bare of universal human ideals. Although others might not be aware of it, it was clear to the interrogators at least that the cases were fabricated. Except at staff conferences, they could not seriously say to one another or to themselves that they were exposing criminals. Nonetheless, they kept right on producing depositions page after page to make sure that we rotted. So the essence of it all turns out to be the credo of the Blatnye, the underworld of Russian thieves. You today, me tomorrow. They understood that the cases were fabricated, yet they kept on working year after year. How could they? Either they forced themselves not to think, and this in itself means the ruin of a human being, and simply accept that this was the way it had to be, and that the person who gave them their orders was always right. But didn't the Nazis too, it comes to mind, argue that same way? Or else it was a matter of the progressive doctrine, the granite ideology. An interrogator in awful Orotikon, sent there to the Kolyma in 1938 as a penalty assignment, was so touched when M. Lurier, former director of the Crevoy Rogue Industrial Complex, readily agreed to sign an indictment which meant a second camp term that he used the time they had thus saved to say, you think we get any satisfaction from using persuasion? We have to do what the party demands of us. You are an old party member. Tell me what you tell me what would you do in my place? 
Apparently, Lurier nearly agreed with him, and it may have been the fact that he had already been thinking in some such terms that led him to sign so readily. It is, after all, a convincing argument. But most often it was merely a matter of cynicism. The Blue Caps understood the workings of the meat grinder and loved it. In the Jita camps in 1944, interrogator Mironenko said to the condemned Babich with pride in his faultless logic, Interrogation and trial are merely judicial corroboration. They cannot alter your fate, which was previously decided. If it is necessary to shoot you, then you will be shot even if you are altogether innocent. If it is necessary to acquit you, then no matter how guilty you are, you will be cleared and acquitted. Just give us a person and we'll create the case. That was what many of them said jokingly, and it was their slogan. What we think of as torture, they think of as good work. The wife of the interrogator, Nikolai Grabischchenko, the Volga Canal Project, said touchingly to her neighbors, Kolya is a very good worker. One of them didn't confess for a long time, and they gave him up to Kolya. Kolya talked with him for one night, and he confessed. What prompted them all to slip into harness and pursue so zealously not truth, but totals of the processed and condemned? Because it was most comfortable for them not to be different from the others. And because these totals meant an easy life, supplementary pay, awards and decorations, promotions and rank, and the expansion and prosperity of the organs themselves. If they ran up high totals, they could loaf when they felt like it, or do poor work, or go out and enjoy themselves at night. And that is just what they did. Low totals led to their being kicked out, to the loss of their feed bag. For Stalin could never be convinced that in any district or city or military unit, he might suddenly cease to have enemies. That was why they felt no mercy, but instead an explosion of resentment and rage toward those maliciously stubborn prisoners who opposed being fitted into the totals, who would not capitulate to sleeplessness or the punishment cell or hunger. By refusing to confess, they menaced the interrogator's personal standing. It was as though they wanted to bring him down. In such circumstances, all measures were justified. If it's to be war, then war it will be. We'll ram this tube down your throat, swallow that salt water. So he's talking here about the members of the, the gulag system, the, the blue caps as he calls them. Um, how they're not pursuing truth in these these interrogations and trials. They're pursuing quotas for how many people they have to convict. So we might ask the question as we're reading this, what kind of a person could do something like that? What kind of person could knowingly torture an innocent person into a false confession? could knowingly inflict huge amounts of suffering on an innocent person in order to gain a false confession out of them. What kind of a monster could do something like that? All of these people, all of these interrogators in the gulag system, interrogators and prosecutors and prison guards, that's who uh, Solzhenitsyn is talking about here. So he's, he's painting a picture of how, how evil these people's actions were. They were part of a system that, that perpetuated this evil on its own citizens. But he's also painting a picture of... He, he's also trying to explain why they would do these things. Their own standing depends on it. He talks about how if they ran up high totals, they could loaf when they felt like it or do poor work or go out and enjoy themselves at night. They gain personal benefit from committing acts like this if they gain the, the proper amount of confessions out of maybe innocent people. So we get a picture painted of how evil these people's actions were and also the beginnings of an explanation for why they were committing those acts. Let's continue. 
Excluded by the nature of their work and by deliberate choice from the higher sphere of human existence, the servitors of the blue institution lived in their lower sphere with all the greater intensity and, and avidity. And there they were possessed and directed by the two strongest instincts of the lower sphere, other than hunger and sex, greed for power and greed for gain, particularly for power. In recent decades, it has turned out to be more important than money. That's, boy, is that true. Power is a poison well known for thousands of years. If only no one were ever to acquire material power over others. But to the human being who has faith in some force that holds dominion over all of us, and who is therefore conscious of his own limitations, power is not necessarily fatal. For those, however, who are unaware of any higher sphere, it is a deadly poison. For them, there is no antidote. Here, attraction is not the right word. It is intoxication. After all, it is intoxicating. You are still young, still, shall we say parenthetically, a sniveling youth. Only a little while ago, your parents were deeply concerned about you and didn't know where to, where to turn to launch you in life. You were such a fool that you didn't even want to study, but you got through three years of that school, and then how you took off and flew. How your situation changed, how your gestures changed, your glance, the turn of your head. The learned council of the scientific institute is in session. You enter and everyone notices you and trembles. You don't take the chairman's chair. Those headaches are for the rector to take on. You sit off to one side, but everyone understands that you are head man there. You are the special department. And you can sit there for just five minutes and then leave. You have that advantage over the professors. You can be called away by more important business, but later on, when you're considering their decision, you will raise your eyebrows, or better still, purse your lips and say to the rector, you can't do that, there are special considerations involved. That's all, and it won't be done, or else you are an osobist, a state, sec a state security representative in the army, a smersh man, and a mere lieutenant. But the portly old colonel, the commander of the unit, stands up when you enter the room and tries to flatter you, to play up to you. He doesn't even have a drink with his chief of staff without inviting you to join them. You have a power over all the people in that military unit, or factory, or district, incomparably greater than that of the military commander, or factory director, or secretary of the, dist of the district communist party. These men control people's military or official duties, wages, reputations, but you control people's freedom. And no one dares speak about you at meetings, and no one will ever dare write about you in the newspaper, not only something bad, but anything good. They don't dare. Your name, like that of a jealously guarded deity, cannot even be mentioned. You are there, everyone feels your presence, but it's as though you didn't exist. From the moment you don that heavenly blue service cap, you stand higher than the publicly acknowledged power. No one dares check up on what you do, but no one is exempt from your checking up on him. And therefore, in dealing with ordinary so-called citizens, who for you are mere blocks of wood, it is altogether appropriate for you to wear an ambiguous and deeply thoughtful expression. For of course, you are the one, and no one else, who knows about the special considerations, and therefore you are always right. God, does that sound familiar? Does that sound like <laughs> kids straight out of school joining joining this system, <laughs> the the blue caps, and instantly in their immature state as kids fresh out of school gaining these vast amounts of power over over people who, with with a lot more life experience than them doesn't that sound familiar <laughs> doesn't that sound like kids fresh out of high school going to colleges and joining social justice mobs and and wielding power over their over their college administrations that, that's a little bit of a, a little bit of a tangent there, but that sounds really familiar to me. Continuing, there is just one thing you must never forget. You too would have been just such a poor block of wood 
if you had not had the luck to become one of the little links in the organs. That flexible, unitary organism inhabiting a nation as a tapeworm inhabits a human body. Everything is yours now. Everything is for you. Just be true to the organs. They will always stand up for you. They will help you swallow up anyone who bothers you. They will help you move every obstacle from your path. But be true to the organs. Do everything they order you to. They will do the thinking for you in respect to your functions too. <laughs> so all you have to do to maintain your power is don't fucking step out of line. Let the system think for you. Don't step out of line. Or you will quickly become one of those people that you have just been wielding power over. The social justice types would do well to remember that. And, you know, there's plenty of stories of people who were involved in that, involved in Twitter hate mobs, getting people deplatformed, getting people fired. And they said one little thing that was out of line, and the mob turned on them. So let, let social justice think for you. But don't step out of line. You can maintain your position of power, your membership in this, in this mob that wields power over, over the rest of the normal people, the people that aren't in your system, that aren't in your club. But if you step out of line, the mob will turn on you. The duties of an interrogator require work, of course. You have to come in during the day, at night, sit for hours and hours, but not split your skull over proof. Quote, unquote. Let the prisoner's head ache over that. And you don't have to worry whether the prisoner is guilty or not, but simply do what the organs require, and everything will be all right. It will be up to you to make the interrogation periods pass as pleasurably as possible, and not to get overly fatigued. And it would be nice to get some good out of it, at least to amuse yourself. You have been sitting a long time, and all of a sudden a new method of persuasion occurs to you. Eureka! So you call up your friends on the phone, and you go around to other offices and tell them about it. What a laugh! Who shall we try it on, boys? It's really pretty monotonous to keep doing the same thing all the time. Those trembling hands, those imploring eyes, that cowardly submissiveness, they are really a bore. If you could just get one of them to resist. I love strong opponents. It's such fun to break their backs. And if your opponent is so strong that he refuses to give in, all your methods have failed and you are in a rage, then don't control your fury. It's tremendously satisfying, that outburst. Let your anger have its way. Don't set any bounds to it. Don't hold yourself back. That's when interrogators spit in the open mouth of the, mouth of the accused and shove his face into a full cuspidor. That's the state of mind in which they drag priests around by their long hair or urinate in a kneeling prisoner's face. After such a storm of fury, you feel yourself a real, honest-to-God man. Outrage feels good, is the point there. Surrender to the rage. Let it take you over, because it feels great. Continuing. Or else you are interrogating a, f a foreigner's girlfriend, quote-unquote. So you curse her out, and then you say, Come on now, does an American have a special kind of... Blank? There's a blank written here, I'm not censoring it. Is that it? Weren't there enough Russian ones for you? And all of a sudden you get an idea. Maybe she learned something from those foreigners. Here's a chance not to be missed, like an assignment abroad. And so you begin to interrogate her energetically. How? What positions? More? in detail. Every scrap of information. You can use the information yourself and you can tell the other boys too. The girl is blushing all over and in tears. It doesn't have anything to do with the case, she protests. Yes it does. Speak up. That's power for you. She gives you the full details. If you want, she'll draw a picture for you. If you want, she'll demonstrate with her body. 
She has no way out. In your hands you hold the punishment cell and her prison term. And if you have asked for a stenographer to take down the questions and answers, and they send in a pretty one, you can shove your paw down into her bosom right in front of the boy being interrogated. He's not a human being, after all, and there is no reason to feel shy in his presence. In fact, there's no reason for you to feel shy with anyone. And if you like the broads, and who doesn't, you'd be a fool not to make use of your position. Some will be drawn to you because of your power, and others will give in out of fear. So you've met a girl somewhere and she's caught your eye? She'll belong to you, never fear. She can't get away. Someone else's wife has caught your eye. She'll be yours too. Because, after all, there's no problem about removing the husband. No, indeed. To know what it meant to be a blue cap, one had to experience it. Anything you saw was yours. Any enemy was struck from your path. The earth beneath your feet was yours. The heaven above you was yours. It was, after all, like your cap, sky blue. So more painting a picture of the perks of being a blue cap, the perks of being, a, being an interrogator. The power is intoxicating. Continuing. The passion for gain was their universal passion. After all, in the absence of any checking up, such power was inevitably used for personal enrichment. One would have had to be holy to refrain. If we were able to discover the hidden motivation behind individual arrests, we would be astounded to find that, granted the rules governing arrests in general, 75% of the time the particular choice of whom to arrest, the personal cast of the die, was determined by human greed and vengefulness. And of that 75%, half were the result of material self-interest on the part of the local NKVD, and of course the prosecutor too, for on this point I do not distinguish between them. The NKVD is the Soviet secret police. I'm not sure exactly what it stands for, but they're like the precursor to the KGB, which was famous from the Cold War era. That's what the NKVD is. It's, it's like the Soviet version of the, of the Gestapo. Continuing. The motivations and actions of the blue caps are sometimes so petty that one can only be astounded. Security officer Senchenko took a map case and dispatch case from an officer he'd arrested and started to use them right in his presence. And, by manipulating the documentation, he took a pair of foreign gloves from another prisoner. When the, army, when the armies were advancing, the blue caps were especially irritated because they got only second pick of the booty. The counterintelligence officer of the 49th Army who arrested me had a yen for my cigarette case. And it wasn't even a cigarette case, but a small German army box of attempting scarlet, however. And because of that piece of shit, he carried out a whole maneuver. As his first step, he omitted it from the list of belongings that were confiscated from me. You can keep it. He thereupon ordered me to be searched again, knowing all the time that it was all I had in my pockets. Aha! What's that? Take it away. And to prevent my protests, put him in the punishment cell. What czarist gendarme would have dared behave that way toward a defender of the fatherland? Every interrogator was given an allowance of a certain number of cigarettes to encourage those willing to confess and to reward stool pigeons. Some of them kept all the cigarettes for themselves. Even in accounting for hours spent in interrogating, they used to cheat. They got higher pay for night work, and we used to note the way they wrote down more hours on the night interrogations than they really spent. Interrogator Fyodorov stole a wristwatch while searching the apartment of the free person Korzukin. During the Leningrad blockade, interrogator Nikolai Fyodorovich Kruzhkov told Yelizaveta Viktorovna Strakovich, wife of the prisoner he was interrogating, K.I. Strakovich, I want a quilt. Bring it to me. When she replied, all our warm things are in the room, are in the room they've sealed. He went to her apartment and, without breaking the state security seal on the lock, unscrewed the entire doorknob. That's how the MGB works, he explained gaily. And he went in and began to collect the warm things, shoving some crystal in his pocket at the same time. She herself tried to get whatever she could out of the room, but he stopped her. That's enough for you. 
and he kept on raking in the booty. There's no end to such cases. One could issue a thousand white papers, and beginning in 1918, too. One would need only to question systematically former prisoners and their wives. Maybe there are and were blue caps who never stole anything or appropriated anything for themselves, but I find it impossible to imagine one. I simply do not understand. Given the blue caps philosophy of life, what was there to restrain them if they liked some particular thing? Way back at the beginning of the 30s, when all of us were marching around in the German uniforms of the Red Youth Front and were building the first five-year plan, they were spending their evenings in salons like the one in the apartment of Concordia Iose, behaving like members of the nobility or Westerners, and their lady friends were showing off their foreign clothes. Where were they getting those clothes? So more, more evil acts on the part of the NKVD, on part of the Blue Caps. Not only do they torture, and not only do they torture innocent people, gain false confessions out of innocent people, convict innocent people. They they steal from them in the process too. So, evil monsters, right? They're not. They're not people like the rest of us. They're subhuman. They're something else. They're not what we are. Well, Solzhenitsyn is about to tell us not so fast. As the folk saying goes, if you speak for the wolf, speak against him as well. Where did this wolf tribe appear from among our people? Does it really stem from our own roots, our own blood? It is our own. And just so we don't go around flaunting too proudly the white mantle of the just, let everyone ask himself, if my life had turned out differently, might I myself not have become just such an executioner? It is a dreadful question if one really answers it honestly. Yes, it is. So now he's telling us, don't be too quick to judge those people because you might have been one of those people if things had just turned out a little bit differently in your life. He's saying, don't ignore our own capacity to do things like this because they're not something other than human. They are human like us and humans have the capacity to do evil. I remember my third year at the university in the fall of 1938. We young men of the Komsomol were summoned before the district Komsomol committee not once but twice. Scarcely bothering to ask our consent, they shoved an application form at us. You've had enough physics, mathematics, and chemistry. It's more important to your country for you to enter the NKVD school. That's the way it always is. It isn't just some person who needs you. It is always your motherland. And it, is al and it is always some official or other who, who speaks on behalf of your motherland and who knows what she needs. I want to read that again. That's the way it always is. It isn't just some person who needs you. It is always your motherland. And it is always some official or other who speaks on behalf of your motherland who knows what she needs. So it's not just that a person who ne needs you to do something, it's that the ideal of your communist government needs you. And it just so happens that this guy who's talking to you right now knows the will of your government and knows exactly what your government needs. One year before, the district committee had conducted a drive among us to recruit candidates for, their, for the Air Force schools. We avoided getting involved that time, too, because we didn't want to leave the university. But we didn't sidestep recruitment then as, so, as stubbornly as we did this time. Twenty-five years later, we could think, well, yes, we understood the sort of arrests that were being made at the time, and the fact that they were torturing people in prisons, and the slime they were trying to drag us into. But it isn't true. After all, the Black Marias were going through the streets at night, and we were the same young people who were parading with banners during the day. How could we know anything about those arrests, and why should we think about them? 
All the provincial leaders had been removed, but as far as we were concerned, it didn't matter. Two or three professors had been arrested, but after all, they hadn't been our dancing partners, and it might even be easier to pass our exams as a result. Twenty-year-olds, we marched in the ranks of those born the year the revolution took place. And because we were the same age as the revolution, the brightest of futures lay ahead. So, so he's saying that he was, he was recruited, Solzhenitsyn is saying he was recruited by the NKVD, but chose not to go. Um, and right here he says, he could look back 25 years later and, and say in hindsight, yeah, I totally knew about the evil things they were doing. But he tells us right here in this paragraph that, that uh, he, would be, he would be deceiving himself if he thought that. In other words, the fact that the NKPD was doing evil things is not the reason he chose not to go. He chose not to go because he wanted to stay in university. That's all it was. And he, can, he says he could deceive himself and say that he didn't want to go because of the evil they were doing and because he didn't want to get involved in that, but that wouldn't be true. That would be self-deception on his part to think that. It would be hard to identify the exact source of that inner intuition, not founded on rational argument, which prompted our refusal to enter the NKVD schools. It certainly didn't derive from the, from the lectures on historical materialism we listened to. It was clear from them that the struggle against the internal enemy was a crucial battlefront, and to share in it was an honorable task. Our decision even ran counter to our material interests. At that time, the provincial university we attended could not promise us anything more than the chance to teach in a rural school in a remote area for miserly wages. The NKVD school dangled before us special rations and double or triple pay. Our feelings could not be put into words, and even if we had found the words, fear would have prevented our speaking them aloud to one another. It was not our minds that resisted, but something inside our breasts. People can shout at you from all sides, you must. And your own head can be saying also, you must. But inside your breast, there is a sense of revulsion, repudiation. I don't want to. It makes me feel sick. Do what you want without me. I want no part of it. So that kind of contradicts a little bit what I said before. It was a, an inner feeling, like a, an intuitive kind of thing that, that made him not want to go. Still, some of us were, were recruited at that time, and I think that if they had really put the pressure on, they could have broken everybody's resistance. So I would like to imagine if, by the time the war broke out, I had already been wearing an NKVD officer's insignia on my blue tabs, what would I have become? What do shoulder boards do to a human being? In other words, what does power do to, do to a human being? The shoulder boards are power. They're position and power. Continuing, and where have all the exhortations of grandmother standing before an icon gone? And where are the young pioneers daydreams of future sacred equality? And at the moment when my life was turned upside down and the Smirsh officers at the brigade command point tore off those cursed shoulder boards and took, and took my belt away and shoved me along to their automobile, I was pierced to the quick by worrying how in my stripped and, star and sorry state I was going to make my way through the telephone operator's room. The rank and file must not see me in that condition. So let the reader who expects this book to be a political expose slam its covers shut right now. If only it were all so simple. So the, these, these next couple of paragraphs coming up right now are probably among, pro maybe the most powerful thing that I've ever read. If only it were all so simple. If only there were evil people somewhere insidiously committing evil deeds and it were necessary only to separate them from the rest of us and destroy them. But the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. And who is willing to destroy a piece of his own heart? During the life of any heart, this line keeps changing place. Sometimes it is squeezed one way by exuberant evil, and sometimes it shifts to allow enough space for good to flourish. 
one and the same human being is, at various ages, under various circumstances, a totally different human being. At times he is close to being a devil, at times to sainthood. But his name doesn't change, and to that name we ascribe the whole lot, good and evil. Socrates taught us, know thyself. Confronted by the pit into which we are about to toss those who have done us harm, we halt, stricken dumb. It is, after all, only because of the way things worked out that they were the executioners and we weren't. From good to evil is one quaver, says the proverb, and correspondingly from evil to good. Whoever got in by mistake either adjusted to the milieu or else was thrown out or eased out or even fell across the rails himself. Still, were there no good people left there? So this is where he kind of brings it all together. He says that, wouldn't it be great if the world was just a place full of a bunch of evil people and a bunch of good people? And all we had to do to build a better world is to figure out which ones the evil people are and destroy them, get rid of them, put them off somewhere else. And we can all, all of us good people can just live here together in harmony and everything will be great, right? But he says, no, that's not, that's not the way it is. It would be great if that was the way it is, but it's not. Because... The line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. Every human being has a capacity for evil, has a, has a capacity for being a monster. And to bring it back to the, the Christchurch shooting, or to any mass shooting or act of terrorism, really, when we try to pretend that that shooter or that terrorist isn't one of us, they're not they're an evil person. We are good people and we need to demonize the evil people and destroy them. And what he did was evil and deserves to be punished. But when we, when we go overboard with talking like that, I think we ignore our own capacity for evil. We ignore the, the capacity for evil that every human being has. I'm sure when that shooter, or when any mass shooter or terrorist, I'm sure when they were a little kid, they might never, they probably never thought that they would be capable of doing something like that. You imagine a, a six-year-old kid thinking, oh yeah, someday I'm totally going to be a mass shooter. I'm totally going to walk into a mosque and gun down 49 people. Nobody would think that when they're six years old. None of us would think that we're capable of doing something like that, and yet it happens. People do it. People are capable of that. People are capable of other evil acts. And I think we ignore that at our peril. We ignore that in ourselves at our peril. The line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. And who is willing to destroy a piece of his own heart? I think that's why we want to ignore our own capacity for evil. If we have to if the evil people are the people that have to be destroyed, then in order to admit that we ourselves have a capacity for evil, we would have to destroy a piece of ourselves. We would have to destroy the evil part of ourselves. And that would be painful. So who wants to do it? Who is willing to destroy a piece of his own heart? Even if it needs to go. Even if it's that evil part that needs to go. Who is willing to destroy that? And because we aren't willing to destroy it, 
we would rather not admit that it's there. So during the life of any heart, this line keeps changing place. Sometimes it is squeezed one way by exuberant evil, and sometimes it shifts to allow enough space for good to flourish. One and the same human being is, at various ages, under various circumstances, a totally different human being. At times he is close to being a devil, at times to sainthood. But his name doesn't change, and to that name we ascribe the whole lot, good and evil. And then he says in this next paragraph, he... He cautions us to not be so quick to those of us who are in the position of destroying or wanting to destroy the evil people in the world. He cautions us to not, maybe not be so quick to do that or to want to do that. Confronted by the pit into which we are about to toss those who have done us harm, we halt, stricken dumb. It is, after all, only because of the way things worked out that they were the executioners and we weren't. Applied to the terrorism or mass shooting, it is, after all, only because of the way things worked out that they were the terrorist and we weren't, that they were the mass shooter and we weren't. This is a really heavy thing to think about, to, to think that we might be capable of something like that. But that shooter probably, you know, before he became possessed by that ideology that prompted him to do that shooting, he probably didn't think he was capable of, of something like that either. So he's not arguing here that we shouldn't punish people who do evil. He's just saying that maybe we should think about this before we do. So I'm just going to read these these couple of paragraphs again because before I finish this chapter because these couple of paragraphs are really important, I think. If only it were all so simple. If only there were evil people somewhere insidiously committing evil deeds, and it were necessary only to separate them from the rest of us and destroy them. But the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. And who is willing to destroy a piece of his own heart? During the life of any heart, this line keeps changing place. Sometimes it is squeezed one way by exuberant evil, and sometimes it shifts to allow enough space for good to flourish. One and the same human being is, at various ages, under various circumstances, a totally different human being. At times he is close to being a devil, at times to sainthood. But his name doesn't change, and to that name we ascribe the whole lot, good and evil. Socrates taught us, know thyself. Confronted by the pit into which we are about to toss those who have done us harm, we halt, stricken dumb. It is, after all, only because of the way things worked out that they were the executioners and we weren't. From good to evil is one quaver, says the proverb, and correspondingly from evil to good. Whoever got in by mistake either adjusted to the milieu or else was thrown out or eased out or even fell across the rails himself. Still, were there no good people left there? Continuing with the rest of the chapter. In Kashinev, a young Lieutenant Gabist went to Father Viktor Shipoval Shipovalnikov a full month before he was arrested. Get away from here. Go away. They plan to arrest you. Did he do this on his own, or did his mother send him to warn the priest? After the arrest, this young man was assigned to Father Viktor as an escort guard, and he grieved for him. Why didn't you go away? When the interrogator Goldman gave Vera Korneyeva the 206 form on non-disclosure to sign, she began to catch on to her rights, and then she began to go into the case in detail, involving, as it did, all 17 members of their religious group. Goldman raged, but he had to let her study the file. 
In order not to be bored waiting for her, he left her to a large office where, a dozen, where half a dozen employees were sitting and left her there. At first, she, she read quietly, but then a conversation began, perhaps because the others were bored, and Vera launched aloud into a real religious sermon. One would have had to know her to appreciate this to the full. She was a luminous person, with a lively mind and a gift of eloquence, even though in freedom she had been no more than a lathe operator, a stable girl, and a housewife. They listened to her, to her impressively, now and then asking questions in order to clarify something or other. It was catching them from an unexpected side of things. People came in from other offices, and the room filled up. Even though they were only typists, stenographers, file clerks, and not interrogators, in 1946 this was still their milieu, the organs. It is impossible to reconstruct her monologue. She managed to work in all sorts of things, including the question of traitors of the motherland. Why were there no traitors in the 1812 War of the Fatherland, when there was still serfdom? It would have been natural to have traitors then, but mostly she spoke about religious faith and religious believers. Formerly, she declared, unbridled passions were the basis for everything. Steal the stolen goods, and in that state of affairs, religious believers were naturally a hindrance to you. But now, when you want to build and prosper in this world, why do you persecute your best citizens? They represent your most precious material. After all, believers don't need to be watched, they do not steal, and they do not shirk. Do you think you can build a just society on a foundation of self-serving and envious people? Everything in the country is falling apart. Why do you spit in the hearts of your best people? Separate church and state properly and do not touch the church. You will not lose a thing thereby. Are you materialists? In that case, put your faith in education, in the possibility that it will, as they say, disperse religious faith. But why arrest people? At this point, Goldman came in and started to interrupt rudely. But everyone shouted at him, Oh, shut up. Keep quiet. Go ahead, woman. Talk. And how should they have addressed her? Citizeness? Comrade? Those forms of address were forbidden, and these people were bound by the conventions of Soviet life. But woman, that was how Christ had spoken, and you couldn't go wrong there. And Vera continued in the presence of her, of her interrogator. So there, in the MGB office, those people listened to Kornieva. And why did the words of an insignificant prisoner touch them so near the quick? And why is it that for nearly 200 years the security forces have hung on to the color of the heavens? That was what they wore in the Lermontov's lifetime. And you, blue uniforms. Then came blue service caps, blue shoulder boards, blue tabs, and then they were ordered to make themselves less conspicuous, and the blue brims were hidden from the gratitude of the people, and everything blue on heads and shoulders was made narrower until what was left was piping, narrow rims, but still blue. Is this only a masquerade? Or is it that even blackness must every so often, however rarely, partake of the heavens? It would be beautiful to think so, but when one learns, for example, the nature of Yagoda's striving toward the sacred, an eyewitness from the group around Gorky, who was close to Yagoda at the time, reports that in the vestibule of the bathhouse on Yagoda's estate near Moscow, icons were placed so that Yagoda and his comrades, after undressing, could use them as targets for a revolver practice before going in to take their baths. Just how are we to understand that? As the act of an evildoer? What sort of behavior is it? Do such people really exist? We would prefer to say that such people cannot exist, that there aren't any. It is permissible to portray evildoers in a story for children so as to keep the picture simple. But when the great world literature of the past, Shakespeare, Schiller, Dickens, inflates and inflates images of evildoers of the blackest shades, it seems somewhat farcical and clumsy to our contemporary perception. The trouble lies in the way these classic evildoers are pictured. They recognize themselves as evildoers and they know their souls are black, and the reason I cannot live unless I do evil. So I'll set my father against my brother. I'll drink the victim's sufferings until I'm drunk with them. Iago very precisely identifies his purpose and his motives as being black and born of hate. But no, that's not the way it is. To do evil, a human being must first of all believe that what he's doing is good, or else that it's a well-considered act in conformity with natural law. 
Fortunately, it is in the nature of the human being to seek a justification for his actions. Macbeth's self-justifications were feeble, and his, conscience devou and his conscience devoured him. Yes, even Iago was a little lamb, too. The imagination and the spiritual strength of Shakespeare's evildoers stopped short at a dozen corpses, because they had no ideology. So he's saying some of the great literature of the past has painted evildoers, quote-unquote, as those evil people, those evil monsters over off in their evil monster world doing evil monstrous things. But that's not what it really is. That's not the way it really is in the real world because in the real world people who do evil don't believe they're doing evil. They believe they're doing good. They believe they're, or at least that their actions are justified. They, they might believe that that they're doing something bad, but they think it's justified. They believe they're justified in doing something bad. It, it is in the nature of the human being to seek a justification for his actions. Now he's going to get into ideology, which is important because, you know, we can tie this into the, the Christchurch shooting too. This guy had an ideology um, that imagine helped him to justify his actions. Continuing. Ideology. That is what gives evil doing its long sought justification and gives the evil doer the necessary steadfastness and determination. That is the social theory which helps to make his acts seem good instead of bad in his own and others eyes so that he won't hear reproaches and curses but will receive praise and honors. That was how the agents of the Inquisition fortified their wills, by invoking Christianity, the conquerors of foreign lands, by extolling the grandeur of their motherland, the colonizers by civilization, the Nazis by race, and the, ja and the Jacobins early and late by equality, brotherhood, and the happiness of future generations. Thanks to ideology, the 20th century was fated to experience evil doing on a scale calculated in the millions. This cannot be denied, nor passed over, nor suppressed. How, then, do we dare insist that evildoers do not exist? And who was it that destroyed these millions? Without evildoers, there would, be, there would have been no archipelago. So ideology gives evildoers the most powerful justification they could ask for. It lets them believe that they're doing something good, that they're acting in accordance with making things the way they should be. There was a rumor going the rounds between 1918 and 1920 that the Petrograd Cheka, headed by Uritsky, and the Odessa Cheka, headed by Dyke, did not shoot all those condemned to death, but fed some of them alive to the animals in the city zoos. I do not know whether this is true or calumny, or, if there were any such cases, how many there were. But I wouldn't set out to look for proof either. Following the practice of the blue caps, I would propose that they prove to us that this was impossible. How else could they get food for the zoos in those famine years? Take it away from the working class? Those enemies were going to die anyway, so why couldn't their deaths support the zoo economy of the Republic and thereby assist our march into the future? Wasn't it expedient? That is the precise line that the Shakespearean evildoer could not cross. But the evildoer with ideology does cross it, and his eyes remain dry and clear. Physics is aware of phenomena which occur only at threshold magnitudes, which do not exist at all until a certain threshold encoded by and known to nature has been crossed. No matter how intense a yellow light you shine on a lithium sample, it will not emit electrons, but as soon as a weak bluish light begins to glow, it does emit them the threshold of the photoelectric effect has been crossed. You can cool oxygen to 100 degrees below centigrade and exert as much pressure as you want. It does not yield, but remains a gas. But as soon as minus 183 degrees is reached, it liquefies and begins to flow. Evidently, evil doing also has a threshold magnitude. Yes, a human being hesitates and bobs back and forth between good and evil all his life. He slips, falls back, clambers up, repents, 
things begin to darken again. But just so long as the threshold of evil doing is not crossed, the possibility of returning remains, and he himself is still within reach of our hope. But when, through the density of evil actions, the result either of their own extreme degree or of the absoluteness of his power, he suddenly crosses that threshold, he has left humanity behind, and without, perhaps, the possibility of return. So every human being has a threshold beyond which they will be willing to commit evil. And maybe once they cross that threshold, there's no going back. I think we could say that the Christchurch shooter, or any number of other mass shooters, or any of any number of other general terrorists, I think it's safe to say that they've crossed their threshold. They've crossed the threshold of committing evil. And there's no coming back from something like that. But that begs the question, where, is, where, where are all of our thresholds? Where is your threshold? Where is my threshold? I haven't crossed a threshold of evil that, that there's no returning back from. And I'm sure most people haven't. But it's worth asking where that is, and, and I think it's important to admit to ourselves that the threshold exists. Again, I think that's something that we, we ignore at our peril. If we ignore the, the, the existence of a threshold like that, if we don't think that there's ever any set of circumstances possible that could that could lead us down the path of of no return of committing evil that there's no coming back from i think we ignore that at our peril i think most of us don't want to think about it most of, most of us don't want to uh, most of us want to brush it under the rug if we do think about it but it's worth asking where where your threshold is. Where's mine? I don't know. Uh, I, I've had a pretty good life. I, I, I've never been led down a path of a set of circumstances that would lead me to commit truly evil acts. So where's the threshold? I don't know. Where uh, I don't know where anyone's threshold is. But what Solzhenitsyn is telling us here is that there is a threshold. And maybe that's worth thinking about. Anyway, we're almost done. Just a couple of pages left. So, continuing. From the most ancient times, justice has been a two-part concept. Virtue triumphs and vices punished. We have been fortunate enough to live to a time when virtue, though it does not triumph, is nonetheless not always tormented by attack dogs. Beaten down, sickly, virtue has now been allowed to enter in all its tatters and sit in the corner as long as it doesn't raise its voice. However, no one dares say a word about vice. Yes, they did mock virtue, but there was no vice in that. Yes, so and so many millions did get mowed down, but no one was to blame for it. And if someone pipes up, what about those who? The answer comes from all sides, reproachfully and amicably at first. What are you talking about, comrade? Why open old wounds? Then they go after you with an oaken club. Shut up. Haven't you had enough yet? You think you've been re rehabilitated? In that same period, by 1966, 86,000 Nazi criminals had been convicted in West Germany. And still we choke with anger here. We do not hesitate to devote to the subject page after newspaper page and hour after hour of radio time. 
We even stay after work to attend protest meetings and vote. Too few. 86,000 are too few. And 20 years is too little. It must go on and on. And during the same period, in our own country, according to the reports of the Military Collegium of the Supreme Court, about 10 men had been convicted. What takes place beyond the odor and the Rhine gets us all worked up. What goes on in the environs of Moscow and behind the green fences near Sochi, or the fact that the murderers of our husbands and fathers ride through our streets and we make a way for them as they pass, doesn't get us worked up, doesn't touch us. That would be digging up the past. Meanwhile, if we translate 86,000 West Germans into our own terms on the basis of comparative population figures, it would become one quarter of a million. But in a quarter century, we have not tracked down anyone. We have not brought anyone to a trial. It is their wounds we are afraid to reopen. And as a symbol of them all, the smug and stupid Molotov lives on at Gr Granovsky number 3, a man who has learned nothing at all, even now, though he is saturated with our blood and nobly crosses the sidewalk to seat himself in his long, wide automobile. Here is a riddle not for us contemporaries to figure out. Why is Germany allowed to punish its evildoers and Russia is not? What kind of disastrous path lies ahead of us if we do not have the chance to purge ourselves of that putrefaction rotting inside our body? What then can Russia teach the world? So Solzhenitsyn, as a Russian, is asking Russia to be a little bit introspective. He's asking his own system, his own government, his own country to be a little introspective. He's asking, why is it that we can endlessly and relentlessly criticize the evildoers of Nazi Germany while ignoring our own evildoers, the evildoers in our own, uh, in our own camp? So, maybe replace Russia and Germany with your, your groups of choice. Replace Russia and Germany with whatever ideology you subscribe to and some other ideology that you consider evil. So maybe if you're a Western liberal, replace Russia with Western liberalism, and replace Nazi Germany with terrorists, with people like the Christchurch shooter, and ask, why can we punish, why can we punish the evildoers of outgroups the terrorists, why can we punish them and ignore the evildoers within our in-group? And is it reasonable to think that there are no evildoers in our in-group? Is it reasonable to think that everyone in, in the group that we happen to be a part of is a good person? Is that reasonable to think? I don't think so. Because anyone in any group could think that. Looking at your own group from the inside, of course you would naturally think that those are the good people. And because we think that the people in our own in-group are the good people, and we don't want to... We, we want to ignore our own capacity for evil. We want to dehumanize everyone from the other group of this person that just committed an evil act. We want to pretend that they're not human like us. We want to pretend that we don't have the same capacity. And so we relentlessly rail against the evildoers of that group while we ignore the evildoers of our own group. We ignore the evildoers of our own group, and also the capacity for evil of our own group. 
And if we can't be introspective and and take note of our own capacity for evil and and take note of of the evil doers within our own in groups, what can we hope to teach the rest of the world if we haven't set our own affairs in order? <laughs> uh, that reminds me of Jordan Peterson's uh, uh, rule. I, I think it was one of the rules from his book, Twelve Rules for Life. Set your own house in perfect order before you criticize the world. If you ha- if you have a house that's a mess, that uh, your your metaphorical house is a mess, your own psyche is a mess, and you and you haven't you don't know yourself. How can you? go out and criticize the rest of the world and tell all uh, tell the rest of the world how it should be when you don't even know how you should be how could i criticize the rest of the world if i don't even know if i don't even know myself that well if i haven't examined my own capacity for evil how could i rail against other people's capacity for evil. Continuing. In the German trials, an astonishing phenomenon takes place from time to time. The defendant clasps his head in his hands, refuses to make any defense, and from then on asks no concessions from the court. He says that the presentation of his crimes, revived and once again confronting him, has filled him with revulsion and he no longer wants to live. That is the ultimate height a trial can attain, when evil is so utterly condemned that even the criminal is revolted by it. A country which has condemned evil 86,000 times from the rostrum of a court and irrevocably condemned it in literature and among its young people, year by year, step by step, is purged of it. What are we to do? Someday our descendants will describe our several generations as generations of driveling do-nothings. First, we submissively allowed them to massacre us by the millions, and then with devoted concern, we tended the murderers in their prosperous old age. What are we to do if the the great Russian tradition of penitence is incomprehensible and absurd to them? What are we to do if the animal terror of hearing even one hundredth part of all they subjected others to outweighs in their hearts any inclination to justice? if they cling greedily to the harvest of benefits they have watered with the blood of those who perished. It is clear enough that those men who turn the handle of the meat grinder even as late as 1937 are no longer young. They are 50 to 80 years old. They have lived the best years of their lives prosperously, well nourished and comfortable, so that it is too late for any kind of equal retribution as far as they are concerned. But let us be generous. We will not shoot them. We will not pour salt water into them, nor bury them in bed bugs, nor bridle them into a swan dive, nor keep them on sleepless stand-up for a week, nor kick them with jackboots, nor beat them with rubber truncheons, nor squeeze their skulls in iron rings, nor push them into a cell so that they lie atop one another like pieces of baggage. We will not do any of the things they did. But for the sake of our country and our children, we have the duty to seek them all out and bring them to trial. Not to put them on trial so much as their crimes, and to compel each one of them to announce loudly, yes, I am an executioner and a murderer. And if these words were spoken in our country only one quarter of a million times, a just proportion if we are not to fall behind West Germany, would it perhaps be enough? So he seems to be saying there that the ultimate retribution against a person who has committed evil is to get them to drop their facade of justification and admit that they have done evil. Remember he said before that that evildoers don't think they're doing evil. They believe that what they're doing is good or at least justified and so the 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 ultimate retribution is to get them to drop that get them to admit that what they've done was not good or not justified 
It is unthinkable in the 20th century to fail to distinguish between what constitutes an abominable atrocity that must be prosecuted and what constitutes that past which ought not to be stirred up. We have to condemn publicly the very idea that some people have the right to repress others. In keeping silent about evil, in burying it so deep within us that no sign of it appears on the surface, we are implanting it, and it will rise up a thousandfold in the future. When we neither punish nor reproach evildoers, we are not simply protecting their trivial old age. We are thereby ripping the foundations of justice from beneath new generations. It is for this reason, and not because of the weakness of indoctrinational work, that they are growing up indifferent. Young people are acquiring the conviction that foul deeds are never punished on earth, that they, are, that they always bring prosperity. It is going to be uncomfortable, horrible, to live in such a country. And that's the end of the chapter. So he's saying right there at the end, In keeping silent about evil, in burying it so deep within us that no sign of it appears on the surface, we are implanting it, and it will rise up a thousandfold in the future. So he's talking about about Russia as a country right there. He's talking about how Russia needs to admit that that it has evil doers in its population. Because if it doesn't its capacity for evil is going to get buried and rise up in the future. So to to bring this all back around, you could you could say that about individuals too. In keeping silent about evil or about capacity for evil, in burying it so deep within us that no sign of it appears on the surface, we are implanting it and it will rise up a thousandfold in the future. So the way we stop that evil from rising up a thousandfold in the future is not to bury it so deep that we never have to look at it. It's to it's to admit that it's there to ourselves and to think about it. So the point is, to bring this all back around to what made me want to read this chapter and talk about it, um, is this dehumanizing language that people tend to use about mass shooters and terrorists. And I, I don't say that out of any concern for the shooter. I say it out of concern for the possibility that to dehumanize the shooter and make him something other than what we are, we are burying our capacity for evil so deep within us that no sign of it appears on the surface. And we're implanting it where it could rise up a thousandfold in the future. I think we should maybe not do that. That's about all I have to say about that. Um, this was off the cuff. We'll see how it see how it goes over. Um, this is a lot of me reading these words and, and thinking about it in real time, and I'm trying to put my thoughts together as I'm reading and as I'm talking and it's uh, I've, I've, I've actually enjoyed this but um, we'll see how I don't know I'll see I'll see how how I like this when I watch through it again and edit it and maybe I said some stupid things I don't know um, 
but that's what speaking is all about, right? It's about putting your thoughts out there and trying to formulate them and maybe other people can let you know where you've gone wrong. Um, so this has been an exercise in that. Um, thanks for watching or listening if you've made it this far and uh, we'll see you next time. If you like this show, there are many ways you can support it. You can talk about it on your own blog or podcast, you can share it on social media with your friends, or you can leave a rating or review on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you happen to listen to it. If you're watching on YouTube, you can subscribe to the channel and hit the thumbs up button if you like this video. Thank you for your support, and we'll see you next time on Philosophication.